Welcome back everyone to another deep dive. Today we're going to be exploring something pretty fascinating. We're diving deep into Amitabha Buddha and his 48 vows. Oh, this is going to be a good one. And we've got some really interesting sources lined up for you today. We've got some Reddit discussions, uh, some excerpts from Wikisource, and even some Dharma talks. A lots to unpack there. Yeah, and you know, I've always been curious about these vows and the whole idea that they offer this unique path to enlightenment. So are they a shortcut? Are they more like a blueprint? Or is it something else entirely? Right. What is it? Let's find out. Let's dive in. Okay, so, you know, one of the things that always gets me about these vows is how vivid they are. I mean, imagine a realm with no suffering, where everyone has like a body of pure gold, and you have these unimaginable powers. Yeah, it's no wonder people have been captivated by these ideas for centuries. It's intriguing. Oh. Absolutely. <laughs> it does sound pretty amazing. And you mentioned the whole body of pure gold thing. Yeah. You know, our sources talk about this, like Amitabha actually promises this to everyone reborn in his pure land, along with these 32 auspicious marks. It's true. Yeah. But it's got to be more than just aesthetics, right? Oh, for sure. You're hitting on something really important there. In Buddhism, the physical characteristics often reflect inner qualities. So this whole body of pure gold, it symbolizes the purified state of being that you achieve through your practice, you know? It's about being free from all that stuff that weighs us down, greed, hatred, delusion. So not a literal pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. No. Not. More like the inner transformation that leads to a truly liberated state. Precisely. And this transformation is further emphasized in the vows that talk about these incredible abilities, the divine sight, the superhuman mm. hearing. Uh, you even have the power to recall your past lives. Whoa. It's a lot. But they're not just some cool superpowers. Right. These abilities symbolize the heightened awareness, the wisdom that comes from dedicated practice. It's like leveling up your consciousness. Exactly. You sent over some amazing details about these vows. And one that really stood out to me was the vow of no unkindness. Oh, yeah. And, you know, in a world where even scrolling through the comments section can feel like you're entering a war zone, mm. uh, the idea of a realm that is completely free from harsh words and ill intentions. Yeah. That's very appealing. It really is powerful, isn't it? And it points to the importance of skillful speech, which is such a core Buddhist principle. In Amitabha's Pure Land, you use words to uplift, to encourage, to really help others on their spiritual path. So it creates this truly harmonious environment. It does. And it makes you realize how much negativity we actually encounter on a daily basis. It's true. And how much that probably impacts our own state of mind. 100%. And that's a big part of why the Pure Land is often described as a land of peace. It's free from all that external and internal negativity that makes spiritual progress such a challenge here in the Saha world. The Saha world. Can you maybe unpack that a little bit for us? Yeah. So the Saha world, this world that we live in, is seen as a realm of suffering and impermanence. Okay. It's really easy to get caught up in desires, distractions, negative emotions, and that can make it really tough to stay focused on our spiritual growth. It really can. I mean, it does feel like we are constantly bombarded with distractions, with challenges, with things that just pull us in a million different directions. That's true. So the Pure Land offers a kind of respite then, like a more supportive environment yeah. for those that are really seeking enlightenment. Exactly. Okay. You can think of it as this spiritual training ground where you have the best teachers, you have infinite resources, and you are surrounded by this community that is completely dedicated to helping you reach your full potential. It started to sound less like a shortcut and more like you're taking this really strategic approach to spiritual development. Mm. It's like if you are an athlete and you choose to train at this elite facility where you have the best coaches, the best equipment, you're still putting in the work, right? Yeah. But everything around you is optimized to help you succeed. What a great analogy. That's a great way to put it. Right. And this kind of leads us to one of the most famous and I think often misunderstood vows. Okay. The vow of 10 recitations. Yeah. This is the one that really got people talking in those Reddit discussions you sent me. Mm. Some people are just clinging to it as a guaranteed ticket to paradise. Right. And others are like, this is too good to be true. This can't be right. Mm. So what's the deal with this vow? Yeah, it's definitely one of those things that makes you scratch your head a little bit. Yeah. Like on the one hand, you've got this incredibly powerful vow. Right. But on the other hand, it seems almost too simple. That's the thing about these teachings, though, you know, yeah. they challenge us to think outside the box a little bit, to go beyond our usual ways of thinking. OK. This vow of 10 recitations, it's not like a magic formula. Right. It's really about cultivating a deep faith 
and a genuine desire to be reborn in the Pure Land. So it's not enough to just like say Amitabha's name 10 times and then just kick back. And, and no, yeah. it's not a free pass. It's about really wanting to be in that environment to continue your spiritual growth. It sounds like intention is a really important piece of this. Absolutely. Which reminds me of something else we came across in those sources. Like the idea that even just encountering these teachings is a result of good karma from our past lives. Oh, that is a really key point. Yeah. And, you know, good karma, it's not about this cosmic reward system or anything like that. It's about creating causes for happiness, for liberation. Okay. So encountering these teachings means you've already planted some of those seeds, and now you have this incredible opportunity to nurture them. So it's like you're picking up where you left off in a past life. Yeah, in a way. That's pretty wild when you think about it's it. It's a lot to wrap your head around, for sure. But if just encountering these teachings is a result of past actions, what about someone who's like, brand new to Pure Land Buddhism. Well, it means they're already on the path. They may not even realize it, but every step you take with an open mind, with sincerity, it creates positive momentum. Okay. So it's encouraging to think that even just our initial curiosity can be a powerful force. Absolutely. What about those people, though, that might use this vow as sort of like a get-out-of-jail-free card? Like, they live a not-so-great life, mm -hmm. but then at the very end, they're like, all right, time to bust out those 10 recitations. I'm good, right? Yeah, that's where this idea of repentance comes in. Amitabha offers his compassion to everyone, but true transformation requires that we acknowledge our mistakes, that we actively work towards positive change. So it's not a loophole. No, it's about taking responsibility. You can't just phone it in at the last minute. Right, okay, so we're not just hoping for that last minute save. We have to be actively engaged in the process. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Amitabha's vows are incredibly powerful, but we still have to put in the effort. So it's more of a partnership then. Exactly. We're doing the work, we're cultivating our faith, we're practicing diligently, and then Amitabha's compassion is there to support us. Yeah. So we've got the ultimate spiritual safety net. You could say that. But we still have to climb the mountain ourselves. Precisely. And that interplay between our own actions and Amitabha's compassion is really what's at the heart of this practice. You know, we're talking about vows and realms and pure lands. Yeah. It's easy to get caught up in like the fantastical elements of it all. Right. But what does this actually mean for us here and now? That's the big question. Right. How do we connect with these ancient teachings in a way that's relevant to our lives? And it's a deeply personal question too. Mm -hmm. It's about finding ways to embody the spirit of these vows in our daily lives, in our thoughts, our words, our actions. Could you give us an example of what that might look like in practice? Sure. Let's take that vow of no unkindness, for instance. Okay. We might not be able to create an entire pure land, but we can try to create that same kind of space in our own interactions. So being more mindful of how we're speaking to each other, uh, choosing our words carefully, exactly, offering support instead of criticism. Yeah. And it goes beyond just our words, too. It's about how we listen, how we respond when things get tough, how we treat ourselves. It's like bringing a little piece of that pure land yeah. into our daily life. Precisely. And even though we may not reach full enlightenment in this lifetime, every step we take in that direction, it creates these positive ripples. And those ripples, they spread out far beyond ourselves. It's a good reminder that our actions matter. Not just for us, but for the world around us. Exactly. And, you know, that brings us to another really fascinating aspect of Amitabha's vows. Okay. This idea of interconnectedness. Interconnectedness. You mentioned earlier that Amitabha's Pure Land isn't the only one out there. That's right. One of his vows actually makes sure that those who are reborn in his Pure Land can easily travel to other realms and make offerings to countless other Buddhas. Oh, wow. It's not about reaching this one specific destination. It's about becoming a part of this much larger network of wisdom and compassion. So it's like we're all on this grand journey of discovery. In Amitabha's Pure Land, it's like one stop along the way. You could see it that way. A place where we can gather strength and wisdom before we continue to explore. I like that. That's a great way to look at it. But with so much to explore and experience, where do you find yourself drawn? What is it about these teachings that really speaks to you? It really is amazing to think about all these different realms, all interconnected, and just this vast potential for growth, for connection. But then it also makes you wonder, like, where does my own personal journey fit into all of this? Yeah, that's something to really sit with, isn't it? You know, for me, what really resonates is this emphasis on cultivating boundless compassion, just like Amitabha. Okay. 
this unwavering dedication to helping everyone, no matter what they've done in the past, it really speaks to the power of forgiveness, wouldn't you say? It does. And to the potential for transformation. It's in everyone. Yeah. It's a good reminder that we all mess up. We all make mistakes. And it's <laughs> never too late to kind of change our course, right? It's about choosing compassion over judgment mm. for ourselves and for others, too. Yeah, absolutely. But those choices, they're not always easy, are they? No, not always. Life throws some curveballs, you know? It's hard to see the bigger picture sometimes. It's true. The path isn't always smooth. But these pure land teachings, they offer this incredible source of inspiration and support, too. We don't have to do this alone. You know, going through all of this, exploring Amitabha's vows, it strikes me how much they challenge us to really expand our definition of what's possible. Mm -hmm. We tend to think of enlightenment as this distant goal, something mm -hmm. we're always striving for. Right. Way out there. But maybe maybe it's closer than we realize. Oh, interesting. Maybe it's about bringing those qualities, the peace, the compassion, the wisdom, bringing those in every single moment, yeah. every interaction we have. What a beautiful way to look at it, to embody enlightenment not as this end goal, but as a way of being. Exactly. It's finding those little moments of peace in the craziness of life, offering kindness even when it's hard, seeing that interconnectedness in everything. That's powerful stuff. Hmm. It's like we can become living examples of Amitabha's vows, yeah. radiating those same qualities out into the world. Exactly. And, you know, we might not have those golden bodies. We might not be able to teleport between realms. Right. But we can cultivate those same qualities of heart and mind. Mm -hmm. That's what makes the pure land so compelling, you know, that compassion, that dedication to learning and growing. So it's not about running away to some far off paradise. Yeah. It's about creating that paradise within ourselves. Yes. And then letting it flow outward, mm -hmm. you know transforming the world around us. That's the essence of it, isn't it? Maybe that's the true message of those 48 vows, a call to action. Create a world that reflects those same ideals, the peace, the compassion, the boundless love. A world without unkindness, mm. where we meet suffering with compassion and everyone everyone has the chance to live up to their full potential. Yeah, That's something worth striving for, don't you think? Absolutely, it's a journey. And it's not always easy, but wow, it's filled with so much beauty, so much possibility. Well, as we wrap up this deep dive into Amitabha's 48 vows, I want to leave you with this thought. If you could visit any Buddha land, anyone at all, where would your curiosity take you? And what would you offer to the Buddha who resides there? What a beautiful question to leave us with. It's about taking those seeds of inspiration and letting them blossom into something truly extraordinary. So until next time, keep exploring, keep questioning, keep diving deep into the boundless ocean of knowledge.